Reverend Patrick Kennedy, who is here with us for his second keynote, Consecrating Our Dying. And I wanted to just say a little something in introduction. On the first day, I mentioned Joan Allman, who uh, gave the seed money for this conference. And several years ago, when she conceived the idea, she said that she wanted to make sure that the main speakers at this conference were an anthroposophical doctor, someone that works in the, the home vigil or um, end of life care movement, and a Christian community priest. And one of the things that was very important to her were the sacraments that are available to everyone um, through that. So uh, when Patrick and I had a little chat ahead of this, he had actually been thinking about that already. And so uh, we feel like maybe Joan was coming through a little bit. So uh, Patrick, if you're here, could you please say hello to everyone? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Really nice to be here again. Thanks, Laura. So are we just jumping in now? Is it my turn? Okay. I think it's your turn. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I guess I'll say first of all, um, I, I was so sad I got, I had, I had a new kind of encounter with the limits of this medium. I was able to participate in one of the sessions in the main hall yesterday morning. And then when I tried to participate in the breakout uh, or the, the workshops, for whatever reason, my links weren't working. And I was suddenly outside the conference, stuck in, in my home. And because I'm actually, I haven't left my life and gone somewhere, I'm in my life and there's my children and my wife and my house and I've got stuff to do. And I really experienced, I think in a healthy, good way, the loss of not being able to be together in space. So I think um, the special kind of attention and power of soul that we need to permeate this digital subnatural bridge between us with something from the planes above that world in our souls and spirit. Um, I just wanted to call that up this morning that we, especially as we turn towards the most sacred things together, wake up more than usual. It takes like more of us. Yes, as Joan or as Laura mentioned, it was so stunning to me to find out that Joan Allman was behind this initiative because I, through my biography, was blessed to live in the Washington DC area where Joan was living in the last few years of her life. And it was at that time that a radical kind of revelation took place in her when she found out that every executive council member of the Anthroposophical Society, including Rudolf Steiner, had received a funeral from the Christian community. It was like shocking news to her. She had no idea that that was the case. And that was because of a strange thing that had happened through the course of our history, that a kind of seed of division between the mission of the renewal of religious life in the Christian community through anthroposophy and the mission of the Anthroposophical Society and Movement. They had found themselves thinking they weren't supposed to have anything to do with each other. That was, however, not how Rudolf Steiner lived his life. And that gets to the, the quality of what I wanna to try to speak about today. When a child is born, you find the mother and the father, the parents, the family, the community around that child naturally, almost instinctively has the feeling you can't, a child can't simply just be born. You have to do something. That there has to be some kind of sacred event of reception. There's a feeling like 
this is a being that has just been gifted to us. And you can't just like go on like life is normal as if that's not a, a, the most extraordinary event. Something has to be done in the community with the family, uh, a kind of ritual celebration of reception. And so most cultures around the world have always had some kind of way to create a sacred act to receive a soul from heaven. And this became then in the Christian tradition, the sacrament of baptism, which in the Christian community, actually for the first time in the history of Christianity was actually created as a ritual for a child. In Christianity, the sacrament of baptism was actually for adults. And it was only through the help of Rudolf Steiner in the founding of the Christian community that a sacrament was created for receiving a soul out of the realms of light by the community. An incarnational sacrament. In the same way, when a soul is readying to depart or does leave this world, one has the feeling we can't simply just let that happen. Something has to be done. Some kind of action, some kind of community event must take place that serves that moment in the right way. And I know yesterday there were different things that were brought in by different people. I know I was very moved by Melinda Tony sharing her some of the some of the culture around her own husband's dying that they practiced. And you can feel how all of this is just completely in flux now in our in our lives. It's like there was a way kind of everyone did things. And then there is this time where things kind of entered a chaos. And now you can feel everyone's trying to refine again, what are the forms whereby we can accompany this most sacred crossing moment? And if you look and actually study the, 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 the evolution of human consciousness in the West, you can find an exact link between the greatest loss of spirit the deepest kind of materialism emerging when birth and death were removed from life. As, as things we know and experience, that is birth and death became medical, clinical, dangerous things. You had to move out of life. Oh, the child's coming, okay, husband, out the door. You know, family, that's for doctors. Oh, a person has died, nobody touched the body, call the coroner. You know, you have to back away. This is it's dangerous, it's clinical, there's fear. And actually what the, the effect of it is, if you, if you are present for a physical birth with your physical eyes, your physical ears, your sense of smell, your sense of touch, it is very hard to doubt the reality of the spiritual world. It's just like, I remember, <laughs> I remember when my first child came into the world, like, I had to leave the house. We, we were able to have a home birth. I had to leave the house and I think pick something up from the pharmacy. <laughs> but I remember going to the pharmacy and I was just like moving in this like weird kind of slow way. And, and I got in and I just had the feeling like everyone I saw, like, you know, right? Like, you know what's happened, right? <laughs> You, right? Like, I, you all know, right? What's that? <laughs> of course, they had no idea. They're just going about their business. I was high. I was, I was completely lifted out into another experience of reality. And I had taken no extra drugs. <laughs> because the, the sacred gateway that is a spiritual reality becomes a physical reality at birth. 
it, it is, as I said on Friday, it is actually a portal. Beings come through birth from the spiritual world into the physical world. That, so that means the threshold, the gateway is like smellable. <laughs> like, and, and you notice it when, it when you have a newborn in a house, everyone wants to come over, first of all. Like, and you don't even know these people. They're like, can I come over? You know? <laughs> and, and they come and they come to the door and they're like, where's the baby? And they start whispering. They start whispering, you know? And they're like, it's over here. And they like, go over to the, to the door and they're like, shit, can I go in? You know, is it, is it okay? You know? And this might be somebody who would say to you with their words, like, I don't believe in God. I, I, you know, there's no spirit, you know, they would say all these things and, but they're acting like they're about to enter a temple. They're like, I better take my shoes off. You know, it's just natural. And then they go in and they're like, oh my God, is this the temple? You know, can I hold it? Can I? <laughs> you know, like they know deep in their selves, I am in the presence of the holy. It, 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 and you don't have to talk about it. <laughs> they know it. Or if they know it, they're like, I'm not going in there. It's like too scary. It's like, you know, I'm just going to stay out of here. You know, call me up when it's like a human. That thing is too intense for me. <laughs> because it's so present. The threshold is so present at birth. And it's almost an exact mirror at death. If you've had a home vigil, the, the, the mood is different. But you'll notice people having the same kind of behavior. Like, you come near the house and you like have this feeling like, oh man, there's something happening in here that is extraordinary. It is the most sacred thing. And I cannot go in there with my just normal everyday consciousness. I have to take a breath. I have to ready myself. I need to enter it with a kind of inner uprightness and presence. See, if you're present just in the physical world, to physical birth and physical death, the presence of the gateway makes itself known. So in, for us to lose our connection with spirit, it was necessary, you could say, to lose our connection to those two gateways. So the recovery of those gateways, the recovery of a life with birth and dying is actually one of the most profound things we can do to introduce spirit back into culture. And Rudolf Steiner in his work would say, you know, yes, our social problems are very difficult. There's horrible situations going on in the world, major questions we need to resolve in terms of society. And guess what? We need a good and true funeral. That's what he said. He said, you, I know this sounds crazy, but one of the most powerful things for the social transformation of our culture will be to have a true funeral service. Now, I am not prepared enough to tell you where he said that, but I will make sure that my dear friend Laura gets her packet with her quote location. Yeah, Rudolf Steiner said that, and he cared very much about the social, social questions of life, as you, many of you know. So what is this, what are the rights, what is happening around the, the, the sacred crossing of death and how can we begin to have a culture of practices, of sacred practices that serve that moment? And this is where I personally have to just insert my holy shyness. <laughs> um, It's this weird two-edged sword. I think you could say like, in the depths of our bones, we know 
we are called to create sacred ritual to, to meet these crossing points. We have to do it. And it's a part of actually what is inborn in the calling of what it means to be a human being. We are the sacred gateway. We are the crossing point between above and below, between spirit and matter. We are the bridge builders across the river that was described yesterday in that beautiful story. Human beings' nature is priestly. A priest in its nature is the one who is to stand at the crossing point and walk with the beings who are going back and forth. To mediate between above and below, between inside and outside. And the word sacrament means nothing other than the work of a sacred action that brings together inside and outside. That, that's it. That, that, that there would be physical events that are at the same time spiritual ones in every way. Because usually in the existence of what has happened to our earthly existence, the only reason we can poison the earth is because we have been severed from her spirit. If, if we were sensing the presence of the soul and spirit of our mother, we couldn't do it. That shows how we've been separated. And that, that gap, that chasm, calls up in us the calling towards being bridge builders. So sacramental work and altar is nothing other than the place where the bridge is built. And in every single human consciousness, every single human heart, every single human life, that bridge can be built. One needs no special ordination into priesthood to follow this calling. It is the calling of the human being. That's the one side. On the other side, on the other side, if we think about bridge building, think about a river. You are on Manhattan Island <laughs> and you want to create a bridge to the mainland. I may long to build a bridge. I may be full of actually the deepest sense of conscience and inspiration to create something that could connect this side to that side. I can see they're in need over there. I've got to build a bridge. But with all the goodwill in the world, with all the deep feelings of inspiration in the world, if I don't have a higher degree in mechanical engineering, massive access to major materials, and a real workforce that can build this bridge, I'm probably not going to be able to do it. <laughs> like the building of a physical bridge where people and cars can actually go across it and not fall into the river takes a deep knowledge of the invisible physical forces that are at work in materials, in the wind, in gravity, weight-bearing load, the effects of weather, you get where I'm going. It is not something to be done lightly, but with tremendous humility and a sense of honesty with myself. And <clears throat> yesterday or Friday, we talked about how my whole body is actually a kind of revelatory bridge of my spirit. How you look at my eyes and my facial expressions, which are, is all matter, 
and you have an experience of Patrick's soul. Even down to the level that we talked about that my spirit is so imprinted in my body, it's in my fingerprint. So that if I leave a mark on this screen and then do some crime and some somebody comes back here and dusts it, they'll find me, just me, nobody else, just this person. That's amazing. My spirit has imprinted itself down into this fingerprint, which is a very exact design, which is cellular formation. So when I say my spirit has made my fingerprint, now I'm going to say another sentence. I, Patrick, definitely did not. Right? I wouldn't know the first thing how to begin to make fingerprints. Patrick Kennedy, this earthly human consciousness, this self has no idea how to make fingerprints. No. That already now shows you there is a self that is an earthly eye, and there is my higher spiritual self, which clearly knows more than I do. This self belongs to what, uh, what Colleen was talking about in terms of my guides. It leads me into really difficult relationships and situations so I can learn, which this self would be like, I never wanted to get involved with that at all. <laughs> there is a wiser self in me. And that wiser self is able to access the higher spiritual archetypes which actually go into the formation and shaping of bodies that can turn my life body and my physical body, which is made up of the substances of the earth, into an expression of me. So to form a ritual that is in line with what is happening in the realm of those spiritual archetypes, I would have to so transform my consciousness that I could lift it up to higher spheres where I can behold those archetypes. Rudolf Steiner was one of those people, but so was Moses. The picture of Moses, he forms a new priesthood and establishes a new ritual. And, and the picture that the Bible gives us, he goes up the mountain into the smoke and fire and reads in there the spiritual archetypes of the Hebrew ritual that comes down and he brings down and gives to Aaron and the priests. So that when he formed the funeral ritual, which he gave to the Christian community, he said, it is a perfect mirror of a ritual that is being celebrated on the other side of the threshold. Actually, what's happening is, we're celebrating a ritual of departure. And at the same moment, the angels are celebrating a ritual of reception. So when we're doing, you could say, the birth ritual on this side of the threshold, the angels are doing the departure ritual on their side. Birth and death are always right next to each other. So it is a ceremony of birth and reception in the spiritual world. And then <clears throat> the ceremony on this side had to be created in such a way that it is a ceremony of ritual departure that is a mirror of the ceremony of ritual of reception on the other side. So I can tell you, that I do not possess the consciousness to make that ritual. But when I experienced it and when I celebrate it, I experience it works. And I can say, Rudolf Steiner, nice work. <laughs> you seem to be able to create such rituals. So that's kind of the other side of the sword for me of this question of rituals that we, that we in our attempts, move very carefully and with great gentleness and humility into our work. So I want now to, with you, kind of look at 
what the rituals are that were created around the crossing of a human soul from earthly life into the spiritual world at death through the help of Rudolf Steiner for the Christian community, this movement for religious renewal, which was founded in 1922. And I want to do it in such a way that I hope we can see what is happening there at the moment of death and why these are an answer to the challenge of each crossing moment. And hopefully through that, you can also start to feel into what is the kind of special question that is being asked of a community in order to meet that crossing point. To do this, I'm gonna go up and start drawing. Okay, first thing, uh, Laura, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, let me see, I might just scoot it a little closer to make sure y'all can read. All right, better, good. So, those of you who were able to be with Mary Adams, I'm guessing she spoke about the way in which you can look at the journey after death as seven stages. This picture of the soul that is expanding from the earth all the way out through to, you could say, the stars, which is our true home. It's another reason why people want to go see that baby when they're born, because they want to see in their eyes, in the dark part of the eyes, the little black hole, there is this invisible starlight shining out of a newborn. It's another one of those experiences that lets us know where we're from. So we go home. <laughs> At death, we go home. We go back to the stars. And these are pictures in the physical universe that show us our, where we're from, the world that is above us the ever shining world of the lights of heaven. And that these planets of our solar system represent these seven, you could say layers of heaven that we pass through on our way to the stars. There's another way to understand the whole journey of dying as a fourfold journey, where this expansion, this opening and expansion that we do actually goes through four major stages. And I want to look at those with you, and I want to use the world of the elements on Earth to help make those four stages maybe permeable to our understanding. So I'm going to start with this incredible, incredible thing that we, you know, around us, all the time are miracles. And it's about just developing a new way of looking at it to see it. That's why I loved what Colleen shared today. She was trying to look at this moment in such a way that it became permeable so she could see a gift in a pandemic. That's spirit sight. So for me, you can look at the incredible fact that we have water. And water is so extraordinary because a single earthly substance in very quick ways can show us multiple states of being. Multiple states of being. The first and familiar way, of course, is the fluid state. There, it doesn't hold any kind of form for itself. Water flows. It is so extraordinary. My, my children were walking with me by the creek and my daughter's like, Dad, how is it that water can flow? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, exactly. Like we should just take a moment and just go, what? It's a substance that is 
takes on the form of that with, into which it flows. You pour it in a cup, it takes on the form of a cup. You pour it in a creek bed, it does the creek bed thing. A puddle, whatever, whatever is poured into, water takes on that form, it is constantly leaving and letting go of its form and flow. But if it gets cold enough, water becomes earth. That is to say, it takes on the state of being of earth element. It becomes formed in ice. Hard, you can actually walk on it. Oh my gosh, if you move to Canada, you get to know that really well. Giant, massive Lake Simcoe, and my family's just walking out there. People are riding their snowmobiles on a massive lake, fishing in holes. It becomes a field. You're walking out on something that was fluid, it's now earth. If it becomes warm enough, the hard ice earth element melts into fluid and even more warmth turns that fluid thing into air, into cloud. It actually expands so much that it actually becomes vapor and becomes the element of air. So in, in ice, we have, you could say, earth, the earth element expressed. In water, of course, the fluid. In air, the gaseous, vaporous element, water becomes cloud. Now comes the fourth element. Water cannot become this element. In fact, this fourth element reveals itself as a totally new factor. It's actually the causal element. The causal element. What is the source of transformation of the states of being of the water? It is the flame. Warmth, fire. There's a great, you could say, line of demarcation. The greatest threshold is at that fourth element, the fire element, because it is the one, if there is not enough warmth, water becomes ice. If there is enough warmth, it becomes cloud. It's the, it is it is actually sending down a force that is changing the state of being of this other element. And this element through that force can raise its state of being. So if, if water is ice, it itself cannot change its state, but through the gift of fire, it can change its state to the fluid and to the gaseous. Okay, so here I am doing some old Greek science here. Why am I doing this? <laughs> what does this have to do with death? Because this is where we live. In our regular earthly consciousness, we live here. And the plant reveals this to us. That's my drawing of earth. This is the borderland of where the earth touches the air and the sky and the water. So above ground, below ground. When we plant a seed in here, you could imagine the seed is us, right? Remember this picture of out of the heavenly worlds, actually all these souls are pouring down into the earth. They're actually sun seeds down into the earth. And so our regular consciousness is living here in this earthly element, and it will wait there until it gets warm enough. And then it will send down. It will start to open and expand. And if it gets warm enough, it will also go upwards, and it starts doing this. It starts doing river and creek 
it starts doing flow, spreading out in leaves, coming back together in stem, spreading out in leaves, coming back together in stem. It's this living watery element in the midst of the air and the light. Then it forms, all of that is reduced and it reaches a third stage. Now, obviously, you can feel the plant has actually started to touch into the realm of the stars. You go on a walk right now with your children, they'll, they'll see that this, you see a field of grass and you see these blue stars on the earth, it's like the stars have fallen to earth. It takes star power actually entering into the life of the plant to reveal the, arch the archetypal realities of the flower. The stars are appearing on the earth reflected in the forms of the flower, six-pointed, five-pointed stars. But that opening, when that flower opens, what happens is, is that plant becomes air. Fragrance and pollen, actually it becomes a cloud. If the plant actually becomes a cloud. That's why you don't have to be looking at a plant. You can be walking by it. I'll try to do it with my plant right here. You're walking by and go, what was that? And it brings you back around to it because it's now living actually as a cloud around it. It's living in the air. So if it lives, it sends itself out in pollen and fragrance out into the air. Now remember, there is one force that is going up from the seed, from the plant. But what's actually allowing it to do that is all of the force that is raining down from above from that source of light and fire and warmth. So that mutual interchange of forces is allowing this to happen. What this cloud does then is finally call down to it, because the, the plant can go no further. It can go up to cloud level, but in the fructifying plants, it can go no further. Now it needs a being from a higher state of being. It actually needs a winged creature. To fly in and settle into the flower and fructify it from above. And, and the flowers are very inviting for those beings. <laughs> if you've ever, take a, take a peek at your lily or at your iris these days, and you may find yourself wanting to be a bumblebee. Like you just want to snuggle in there and, and warm it up in there. And you're like, mm, they, they hum and buzz, and they bring actually a warmth element there into the plant and bring the pollen from another flower. And what happens is then the fourth stage is reached and that stage then is the fruit stage in which the new seed is contained. And this most amazing moment in the course of, now this flower, by the way, doesn't make apples. <laughs> so please forgive my poor biology. That's not the point. But I use an apple because it's a very beautiful picture. If you ever look at an apple, it belongs actually to the same as the rose family with the five pointed petals. If you look at a rose, uh, uh, an apple blossom, so delicate and beautiful. And just imagine that from a little apple pip, an entire apple tree can come. Again, miraculous. 
So if it seems strange to you to imagine that my single self could expand into the wits of the universe, meditate on the apple pip. But inside this apple and the apple pip, what is there is the alpha and the omega. That's the old term for the beginning and the end. The fruit is so extraordinary because it is the whole goal of the plant to fruit. And the fruit is sweet, is nourishment, is fullness, swelling, ripened, fulfillment. It is the end. After fruit is only rot. <laughs> that it falls to the ground and, and actually the dying processes are the next thing that happens. So it is the full unfolding, the final fulfillment and goal. It is the goal, it is the omega of the plant. And inside the goal is hidden the beginning, the seed of its own future. And this in the experience of the soul expanded to the greatest heights is what happens. Each human being has a chance to be breathed in like a seed into the great omega, the goal. The goal of the human being and of the universe, we are breathed into it so we can be connected to it again. This is the fulfillment, this is the goal. And exactly at that point, what Rudolf Steiner calls cosmic midnight, we also experience, oh yeah, I want to go back down to earth. <laughs> we experience the seed. I, to, to reach this goal, I have to do this amazing work of going back down into the hard parts. Earth is where the hard parts are. Earth is where the death forces, the sick forces, the, the, the forces of untruth, of darkness, we have to wrestle and work and live in this world for the sake of the fruit. We plant the sun seed back into the earth. So we need to come back down in order to reach the goal. We do that. So in our remaining minutes now, And, and Patrick, you can take your time. We have um, a little extra time today. So you actually have yeah. until quarter two, uh, but you can use as much or as little as that if, as you'd like. Yeah, well, good. I mean, I think if anyone who knows me will probably see that I draw this drawing all the time. I, I turn my attention to the realm of the plants because I experience how they reveal all of the secrets of our human experience in an imagination. And it allows us to feel into something that is already a little bit beyond where we are right now, because mostly we're right here. But by attending to the plan, it starts to allow us to flow into the realm of becoming, the realm of the life world of imaginations, to those beings who have a very direct bond with their source of life. We are the beings that have been separated by our, from the bond, set our bond, our umbilical cord has been cut with the mother of who we are. So we can freely choose to reconnect. That's why I, I don't ever believe there will be any collective choice to transform, sadly. And positively, that's because of the love of our guides that Colleen mentioned. Our guides love us so much, they will let us not choose, not heed the call, not respond. But that means when we respond, when any single individual makes the choice to respond and reconnect and reach up and reestablish the relationship, it's that much more powerful and significant because it's a free choice. 
but there was a lot more pain along the way because of freedom. <laughs> so I say that also just in part to say the plants are not free at all. They have an absolutely exact, totally established bond between their star. So we can look at them and see in them revealed secrets of who we could be if we establish the bond with the source of life. So all of this is an imagination of also the process of dying and transitioning into the journey after death. And this represents, you could say, the border, the gate, there are many gates. And one of the gates is the threshold of the gate of death. So I want to look at you, look with you, then at the moments in a human being's experience of this sacred and extraordinary crossing of dying, physical death, and how a ritual tries to address these special crossing points, as it does in the Christian community. So the first... Well, I'll just, I'll just put them up there so you can also just see it now. I'm just going to start to, to put them up there. The first thing that is offered is the sacrament of anointing. The anointing is a sacred rite that is performed before a person dies. That is, when they are nearing the sacred gateway of death. It is, you could say, well, I won't get into it now. So that's when that is done. Then we have the actual death. So this is done right before the gate of death. Then we have actually the death. And then you have the three-day vigil. And then the next crossing point is met by the funeral service, funeral ritual. sacrament. That's a whole thing to understand the difference between a sacrament and a ritual. And then the funeral rite, which has two parts, which I'll look at with you, is followed then on the, on the next coming Saturday when it works. So let's say someone dies, Tuesday, the funeral is Tuesday, that coming Saturday, would be celebrated a communion service for the dead or the departed. I want to come in now and emphasize a number of these gateways, particularly this one. This crossing point and this one. I'll do a different color because it really is a different question. So before I go further, looking at a little bit what happens here at these rites and why they are done a little bit, I want to 
kind of bring in the overarching orientation of all of them. In the Western world that I've experienced, for the most part, the funeral services, also as expressed by this man, I think from Japan in the East, are about grief. And grief is about my feelings. It is, of course, the feelings that I have that emerge in relationship with the one who has departed. So it also expresses our bond. And that is why there's that deep tradition, one ought to cry in all these older, older cultures. We should lament because the one we love has gone. And if you, if you wanted to dishonor someone, you wouldn't cry at a funeral. It's like, I'm not sad you're, you're leaving. But you, in, those, in that, those old cultures, you would also lament and cry when someone would go on a journey. Like crying and lamenting was a part of life. It was so much more a part of life. And in the West, it's like, I'm good. It's all good. I got it. Like that whole thing, the kind of erasing of lament and grief is also a terrible event. And we need to reclaim that as well. However, there is a danger. The danger is love will not be the ruling power at a very important moment in a soul's life. Because this is what they are doing. Their destiny has called them home. It is time for them and they're going through an unbelievable, shocking, dramatic transition of leaving the world they have known and transitioning into other realms of existence. And if everybody is lamenting and crying and knowing a, no one is attending to helping and be there for that person in their crossing, you can almost feel the departed like, hey, <laughs> I know you love me. Show your love by being with me in my transition. So this quality of selflessness and trying to do something loving for the one who is dying, that's the orientation for these, these rites. They are there not to comfort those left behind. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is much more like a doula or a midwife. The, the doula and midwife is not going to be spending their energies on the people around the mother who's giving birth, going, how are you feeling? How is it going for you, right? They're going to be attending to this extraordinary event over here to make sure everything that is needed is brought to it. So that, that gives you a little bit. I mean, I try to do it somewhat humorous, humorously so that you can feel into it a little bit, but it's very, everything about what, is being asked of our transformation right now is to overcome ourselves for the other. And no greater comfort can be brought to the human soul than finding an avenue to love the ones we love. That is what I have found. And so the strange thing is, it's not about us, it's about the departed, and therefore we get actual comfort. <laughs> we end up getting comforted because no greater comfort is there that I have a new avenue for all of my love for my departed one. I have a way to give it that has real effect for them. Okay, that's my little side loop on what they are about in general. So what is this crossing point, the crossing point, the gate of death, when we're giving up the hard form of being embodied in a physical body and about to lay down our physical body and enter into this fluid life element. What is, you could say, the question that is approaching the human soul? And that is, first off, what have I done with my life?
what have I done with the gift that I was given by the universe of my life? To look back. It's something we can begin in preparing for a death well before the death arrives. Are there places in my life where I can still make amends? Now is an opportunity. This reviewing my life, not with physical light, but with moral light. Can I stand before my highest ideals? How, how does my life look in the light of the goal of my life? If I have set love as the goal of all existence, when I look back at my life, what do I see? And it's not about condemnation here whatsoever, but the light of truth, just being truthful, entering into the tr risking standing before and in the light of truth. Because everything in this world is going to be really true. <laughs> like we can still lie to ourselves down in this world. We can live in denial. We can lie to each other. We can do all kinds of things in here. We can keep things dark. To, the medicine for that is lots of light. So I prepare for that world by finding the inner strength to, as best I can, stand before my life in that light. So the first part of the anointing is what is called the sacrament of consultation in the Christian community. But you could say it's a, a life review in the light of the spirit. And what will happen in that moment, of course, is to notice, oh yeah, there were these moments of absolute beauty and joy. The gifts I received, the people I was able to know, the hard parts in my life probably suddenly appear full of light. Wow, if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't be the person I became. The spirit guides were working into my life through all those hard parts. I can say thank you to them. I can say, say thank you to the people who are a pain in my butt because <laughs> they taught me things, because they helped me grow. But I can also see, oh, you know, there I really fulfilled what I wanted to do here on the earth. And there I didn't. I can see my light and my shadow. I can see the ways in which I fulfilled the goal and the ways I didn't. And in noticing the gap between the fulfilled goal and the unfulfilled goal, their natural longing comes up to, you, to, to be unified with the one who is the fulfilled goal. And in the, in, in the Christian community that is experienced as Jesus Christ, the, the whole nature of Jesus Christ is there has to be a single human being in whom love is fully fulfilled. That's the point. And so there is a longing for communion with him. But you could say it in other words, you could say communion with what you hold to be the highest. And then comes the anointing with oil. There's a few other elements in there. And, and here, oil is connected with a very extraordinary power. You notice its power when you put a little bit of olive oil on a piece of paper. And when you put olive oil on a piece of paper and you hold it up to the light, you see the light can actually shine through the paper. The oil makes matter transparent. You could say the challenge of this gate is how do I let 
go of this life and this body and begin to open and expand towards my new life. And the anointing is the sacrament that comes as an aid anointed on the forehead in a special way in order to start and support and help the release of the soul from the body into the realm of soul and spirit. Those who have been anointed in the past are kings and priests. And a king and a priest is someone who has to have a connection to the spiritual world to fulfill their task in a good way. And same with every single human being who is walking through the sacred gateway. Become the anointed. That is all there to aid in the crossing. When you consecrate oil, what we speak over the oil is speaking about that its secret spiritual nature is it makes inclined to love. It doesn't make us love, but it, it kind of makes us inclined to it. And in the olive pit, you could say, those Mediterranean plants that soak in sun power like no other plant capture sun power into the extraordinary power of that oil. Makes inclined to love. Then if a person passes and crosses the threshold, they enter the three-day vigil. It's three days for what the soul is doing then when they're having their life review. Their life body, which contains all of their memories, is spread out before them. This life passing before our eyes experience that we've had over the last century of all those near-death experiences where they describe seeing their life all around them, their entire life, like a panoramic, living, three-dimensional reality all at the same time. So three-day vigil, and I'll be interested to see if there are questions about this part. Um, I won't say too much about it, but let's say someone dies in home, that's always wonderful. Then you can make the vigil room at home so that this person can do a life, first life review of looking at their life body spread out around them. They're doing a deep contemplation of their biography seeing it before them, all of it, their thoughts, feelings, and deeds. After three days, that dissipates, and a new challenge, a new kind of death, a new crossing point happens here. After the three days, you can, you can get to know this experience that when you come to a vigil home, you have the experience the person is still in the home. Their, their presence is around their body, so the body is kept because they need it still for the vigil time, actually. It's a kind of anchor point for their experience. That's been where they've lived for however long. They still need that anchor point. But the life forces, once they release themselves from the physical body, and you can, you can see this if you've been at a vigil, when you get to the third day, how everything shifts. And they start to dissipate. Now there's a new crossing happening. They're leaving the world of life and they're entering into the world of the soul and spirit. It's a new crossing point. And it's at that point then that you have the funeral rite. And the goal of the funeral rite in the Christian community is twofold, or I should say three. Very simply, again, I'll just do it quick so we have time for questions. The first part is Return your body to the earth. Lots of ways to do that, of course. 
But all of this was on loan. It's, we don't take it with us, the substance. And so a sacred rite of returning the substance to the earth, so being at the place where you do that, whether it's for a cremation or for a burial, if you return the body to the earth, you give the eulogy, the good word, you remember their life. This is really powerful because now the question of the departed soul is, you saw me with physical eyes on the earth, but did you see me? Now you can't physically see me, what do you see? Who was I? Did you see me? Actually, every single human heart walks around this question. Do you see me? And they don't mean like this. <laughs> they mean who I am on the inside. And you could say the eulogy is, we see you. And so to try totally selflessly, this isn't, a, this isn't about memory sharing, in, but rather during the three-day vigil, that's a great time for memory sharing, and the priest is listening to all of the stories, all what, what was it like to be around them, how were they like in work, what did they really want to do in life, what were they struggling with, tell me about them. And you're remembering them. They're remembering themselves, we're remembering them. And then in the eulogy, the task is to try to let their spirit appear by telling their story. Not saying, well, I knew them and I really liked them. That's about me. Can I let them appear through the story? That becomes the goal of the one who's holding the eulogy. And then the third step is the, the handing off of the soul to the guides into the spiritual world. You could say entering, I don't know if I have the right word, the, the, the actual, I don't, I'm so sorry, I don't have a better term right now, but I'm going to call it the handoff. I apologize. But it's basically the spiritual activity of of from our community, we are accompanying you as you walk into and enter the realm of soul and spirit. And the funeral speaks of that. We are gathered here at the place where we unite your mortal remains with the earthly elements and are with you at the moment where you are beginning to walk into the calm of soul existence and you are moving into the light of the spirit land. And our community is accompanying you on the bridge over the river. And we are met on that bridge by the spirits from the other side who then take the soul on from there. But that is, that is kind of the core event that happens in the funeral rite. One part begins at home with the closing of the casket, and the second part happens in community. Then I mentioned the service that is held, the communion service. You could say that is the place where we begin to practice or two things. <laughs> guidance on the journey, because the whole service, the whole Eucharist has in its architectural structure, the seven stages of the planetary spheres up to the stars. So that at the moment of communion, you're mirroring the moment of communion here in the spiritual world. 
but you could say the whole goal of creating such an altar on the earth was to create a place where both those who are departed and those who are alive can meet and commune together. That is why the first Christians in Rome met in the catacombs and had their altars there where the dead had been buried. They knew the goal that the ladder begins from us, the next are those who die. And it goes on up through all the ladder of being. And our job is to create the bridge right here on the altar. So the dead and the living unite in communion and the guidance for the journey. All of that practices, for example, in anthroposophical guidance for reading for the dead, for prayers for the dead, that's all a practice of this life together. Now the rest of their journey as it continues to do something always again and again for them where it's not just me here and them there, but where we meet together somewhere in our lives. And that then happens every Sunday in the Christian community. All the dead are invited to participate in the communion. So that's our regular practice. But then there are communities who develop circles of prayer for those who have died. Individuals develop practices to connect with your own dead, your own loved ones. You can create again, that same altar in your own heart. Okay. Dear Joan, I hope that helped and was what you wanted, my dear. I am so glad to have at least been welcomed to try to bring to you something of what Rudolf Steiner brought to us in the Christian community to meet these crossing points. The star and the fruit, you could say, all begin to happen after this layer of being, that crossing point. All right, that's enough for me. I'll sit down now. You deserve to sit down now. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you again, Patrick. Oh my goodness. So many beautiful images and ways of thinking about this that you've brought into connection for us. <sighs> okay, so I think we can take a few minutes. Um, we, we are meant to have a 30 minute break. We're gonna take a 20 minute break instead. So we're gonna do about 10 minutes of questions now. And everybody's typing in thank you. I don't know if you can see all those. Questions. Yeah, I can see some. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. There are some questions in here, but I wanted to start out with a question related to the um, coronavirus and what's happening now. It's actually not just related to coronavirus, but was brought to light by the coronavirus. And that's a question, I don't know how many people saw this picture of Heart Island, um, where there's been, you know, for, I don't know, maybe um, over a hundred years, there's been um, mass graves there for people that are unidentified people don't know who they are and then they're buried there and so this came really strongly i think in the media people hadn't been aware that this was happening maybe they weren't aware of homelessness and um you know immigrants that are unidentified and things like that being buried there when people can't claim the body um can you talk about that a little bit in relationship to this um understanding like when you know, what about these people that um, have crossed and don't, you, you, you mentioned something about, you know, we can't, uh, they're waiting for us. They're like, hey, uh, I just crossed over. You guys, you're going to keep talking to me. What's going on? So would you be able to talk about that? And then I'm going to keep tracking the questions. Well, it's really interesting because Joan Allman had given her entire life up to those last years to children. So she, she was focused on the, the early childhood moment, right? What happens, how are young children received into a community? That was her care and concern, right down to advocating in Washington, you know, for their well-being. And to see her turn towards this other end of life, at the end of her life, too, and wonder, how are we doing that? So you could say those who are called to serve the death experiences in life and those who have crossed the threshold feel a sense of responsibility to serve the dead. 
And that can happen in two really powerful ways that I'll just mention. There are many, many ways, but one simple way is Normally, my little earthly consciousness is full of thoughts like, you know, what do I got to buy at the grocery store? Uh, is there any toilet paper left? <laughs> you know, like it's very earthly lower stuff. It's just thinking about things like that. But my soul is soil. Now, if I put rocks in the soil, then there's just going to be rocks. But if I put seeds in the soil, things grow. And seeds are spiritual truths spiritual true pictures when we ourselves are taking into our own souls spiritual ideas truths about the reality for example of the world in which they now live what we're doing is turning our soul into a garden a small plot where we can grow food for those who have died Maybe you're not, I'm a terrible gardener, brown thumbs right here. I would love to garden. I'm, I'm better at sowing in, in the garden of my soul. And we all can do that. By taking in thoughts, they are not just for ourselves. Because when we lie down and sleep, Rudolf Steiner gets this picture. When you lie down and sleep, those seeds grow up like wheat. And you can imagine in the sleeping world of the living, where all these, imagine, it's nighttime and there are millions of people horizontal in beds. Those are the fields where the dead come looking to harvest something for their own souls. And he says there, imagine if they come and there's no food, there's no grain. You could say our spirituality, our spiritual practice is not just about us. It is about planting seeds so that those who are on the other side of the threshold can harvest the wheat. First thing, just continue to learn. Take it in, plant seeds in your soul. In the communion service just mentioned, we invite all those who have died. That's what the phrasing is. I mean, everyone is invited. On this side, we can only invite those people who've chosen to be Christians because anything else would be violence. To choose my religious practices must be a free choice. But once you've left the body, you can just put out the call in a different way. You are all welcome. Because we know you need something that is a nourishment that is beyond the physical now to keep the bond also with the living and for your journey ahead. So a communion service that is really true and powerful will include all those who have died. Rudolf Steiner did this then in his own practices, for example, in the First World War of creating at the end of every single lecture, a kind of verse ritual that was to send all of the thoughts and feelings and love of those present as nourishment to the angels of those on the field who are fighting war and to all those souls who had died. So it's a sense of responsibility and conscience that we talked about before to the dead. And you can't prescribe this to anyone. It has to be a destiny thing. Somebody who's around that area who feels called, oh, I want to carry that place, this heart island in my thoughts and feelings. I want to take responsibility as a soul on the earth for them. When I pray, I'm not just going to pray for my loved ones. I'm going to pray and meditate for those in Heart Island. So I think that's a little bit of what I could answer in that direction. Thank you. Okay, there's a, there are some, I'm trying to figure out, <laughs> there's so many questions. Um, one is, can you speak a little more to the difference between life reviews during like a near death experience versus a complete death? So do you have any thoughts on that? And then I'll just give you the other question. We'll see what we have time for. Um, the 40 days after death. That's the other question. Mm. Sorry, the significance of those. Hmm. 
if you have the person there who, who asked about the 40 days, you should check it, just double check which 40 days. <laughs> after death, after death. Yeah, no, but why, where is that oh, which... coming from? Because I didn't mention it. So they're thinking, I, I believe I know which tradition they're thinking of. So I would love to know. Um, so if that person wants to type something in again quickly, yes. that'd be super so I can I don't. I just don't want to assume anything. I, I know from my Syrian Orthodox you know, background, at that 40 day mark, there's another thing that happens. So um, another gathering that happens at that time but I don't know what this person was talking about in particular so I mean they're they're for the grieving time and the relationship with the dead they're in different cultures there's been a tradition of the 40 days there's a special mark there and then there's a special mark with the year the first year the first year anniversary oh. so often for example you you would be required to wear black and mourning for a year but then you could take off that and change your garments back into regular life for the 40 days, you would not work, you would not cook, you would not, you would just be allowed to go into deep mourning and the community would care for you. Like we definitely need these practices. Because <laughs> basically it's like person dies, like you get a week, you're supposed to like go back to work. I mean, or you lose your job. Yeah. Anyway, you can see also birth has its ridiculous requirements on people like what you're supposed to do after a child is born two weeks later okay back to work everybody i mean yeah so our world doesn't express these realities as a part of life mm -hmm. so those old cultures had those traditions that understood there are processes that ripen over those days and 40 days is a certain mystery number that has to do with that kind of ripening. guess what everybody quarantine the word quarantine comes from quaranto, uh, what's the days, the um, 40 days in Italian. Because when a ship at sea docked in Italy during the plague, it would have to stay there for the 40 days to make sure that the sickness had passed before they could come on board. And so it's also connected to the 40 years in the desert of the Hebrew people, the 40 days of fasting of Jesus in the desert. There is a very secret power to the, to the 40. I know very little of it, I would say. Just it's like a, it's a new thing that's opening up in my life because I turned 40. <laughs> I'm, I'm 44 and I'm like, oh yeah, 40 is interesting. 40 is very interesting. But um, the, the gifting of a family with 40 days of release from their responsibilities. That picture, for them to go through a certain kind of deep letting in of the death into their own lives. That's my experience of the 40 days. It's less about the one who has died and more about incorporating the death into the life of those who are bereft. Because if you don't and just go back to life, it's going to wait for you in some corner of who you are, and it will come out. So the grieving processes, the, the mourning processes as a part of this on this side of the threshold. That's my understanding of the 40 days. That's great. Thank you, Patrick. And we, we've saved some of the questions that came in through the chat. So I'll be sure to pass some of that along to you. Oh, great. And I, think, um, I think we have to go on our break because we, I know people need a little break before they go to their Absolutely. workshop. So um, I think we can just, do you want to say something to close? I, and then I'll I just, have to, I have yeah, to say it. goodbye. Um, I have responsibilities over here at the seminary and church today that require me to be present for them. And I just, again, want to say thank you to you, Laura, to the committee for the invitation to attempt to try to share some of these things. I hope and pray that they are of some value for you all in your further journey and really hope we can be together in time and space the next time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick. It's